Well, it all started because, quite honestly, I wanted to put a monster in a dress. There's no hidden meaning, no deeper truths, so I sought to indulge my inner Tolkien, cordially dismissing allegory for the sake of a little fun. Over the course of my time as an undergraduate at JSU, I have hit the well of emotional metaphor, dug deep into personal struggles with my life, my faith, and my position as a woman. I mined my experiences for the purpose of expression and self-reflection, and while I found the process very rewarding, there is something to be said for tapping into that childlike sense of wonder, which first beckons us to ruin our mother's walls with permanent markers. Sometimes there is nothing for it but to run barefoot through the grass, a box of crayons in one hand, and a tattered bit of construction paper in the other. Of course, one could find all sorts of subtext and allusions to my series, if they went looking. Several come to mind as I put together seemingly incompatible elements, melding mythology with a repressed era of civility and empire. Though the lens of my work, one might see elements of cultural appropriation and domestication of the feral and the foreign, or monsters just under the surface of every smile, curtsy, and how do you do. With this set, I leave that up to the viewer, and if nothing else, I hope that they find an inviting and whimsical world, ripe for reflection, but also for simple enjoyment of the media. I crafted this series for a painting class last semester. I was allowed my choice of medium within the realm of paint, and as I desired my work to have an illustrative quality, I picked the tools of watercolor, pen, and ink wash. These items offered the control to portray realistic elements while maintaining the underlying aesthetic of whimsy and charm. The subject matter was rooted within my personal love for myth, legend, and folklore. I have always held a soft spot for misshapen monstrosities, seeing them as both misunderstood and wonderfully strange in the best of senses. For this series, I did not limit my ideas to any particular genre or mythos. I took my time delving into the folklore from all over the world before finally settling on the nine characters of my watercolor endeavor. In the end, I chose the Gorgon and the Harpy from ancient Greece, the Tengu and the Kappa from Japan, the Rakshasa and the Manticar from India, the Seder and the Sea Monk from England, and the Jinn from Samaria. These creatures, with these creatures, I decided on then to begin the process of placing them in their new character roles. Due to a recent influx of Jane Austen literature with my personal library, and I'll admit a newly discovered television show, I started to favor the idea of seeing my lineup of miscreants dressed in the position of the Victorian era lifestyle. What had begun as just whimsy very quickly transformed into a labor of love and a desire to hearken to the detail of the period. The Lady of the Low Streets is a jinn and a prostitute. Female jinn are often identified as having a third eye, though in many cases that's a spiritual reference more than a physical marker, and the propensity for granting wishes, however not always to the benefit of the wisher. It is a fascinating combination of both tormentor and pleasurer that, that make the jinn a suited candidate for a lady of negotiable favors. In human form, jinn are often impossible to identify, though some no notable traits are an affinity towards tattoos and an elongated face. His lordship, the Kappa, is from the water spirit folklore of Japan. Many temples are constructed to appease the water-dwelling Kappa, and thus they are seen as more real than myth to many villages near, that reside near the rivers. A Kappa is a water demon that has a mop of wet, stringy hair, pale or green skin, and large, jagged, jagged mouth with sharp teeth. Most notable of the Kappa's appearance is that of a hollowed-out bowl atop their head, or hair, which holds water. Kappas are known to suck the entrails from their victims, so to ensure a happy and long life when meeting an ill-tempered kappa, one should bow. They are then compelled to bow back to you, and in so doing, they lose the water from their head and must flee to the safety of the nearest pond or suffer death. It is this steadfast adherence to the social niceties that make me place the kappa as a gentleman among gentlemen. The female satyrs are very rare, creatures, and according to legend, highly intelligent. They covet motherhood and knowledge above all things. It is for this reason that I chose the satyr as the governess character. While mostly human in appearance, satyrs will often have a tuffet beard on their chin, an elongated neck, horns atop their heads, goat-patterned eyes, these note the oblong sort of pupils, 
and of course cloven hooves, which are not really featured here. Because how could you get that in a portrait? Unless you lift a leg. <laughs> Next in the assortment of Victorian caricatures is that of a hard-working shipwright, a fisherman by trade and a fisherman by birth. I elected to create a sea monk for this personage. A sea monk is not unlike a merman, but as opposed to having half of a human's body and a fish tail, they are wholly constructed of fish scales and body parts, but formatted to appear human. Sea monks are known to keep elaborate grottos underneath the shallow harbors of, boat do of boating docks and often come to the surface when a storm is brewing. During a squall, a sea monk will listen for any sailor who calls upon God for aid and then snatch him up and take him to their grotto in order to teach the man not to take the Lord's name in vain. The sea monks, however, are simple, sort of dumb creatures and don't truly understand that the human need to breathe air as they can switch from air to water without any really without any real transition. The Lady Gorgon was actually the first portrait I painted. The story of Medusa and the injustice dealt her by Aphrodite and Poseidon has often been a legend that spoke to me and made me wish to right the wrongs done. In my own way, making the Gorgon the beautiful blushing lady was my attempt at offering her salvation. Of all the portraits, this Rakshasa was the most difficult. The Victorian era boasted a luscious history of soldiers traveling to the wilds of India to inflict their colonial influence over the location. Reading about that, and then the legends of the variety of demons contained in that landscape, sparked the fuel for the transforming soldier. I painted this colonel as being victim of a recent battle in which he committed cruelties in the name of crown and queen. As a result, he has been marked by a local goddess and will transform into a tiger like Rakshasa in order to pay penance by protecting the very village that his unit was there to destroy. The Dowager Mistress Harpy is, in all honesty, my favorite. Great pains were taken to secure her silvered hair, her folding skin, and her shimmering beak. Harpies are above all else harbingers of doom and death. Many legends paint their escapades as both verbose and cunning, combining their shrieks of wrath with the ability to contrive elaborate plans to capture their victims. After reading many of these stories, it seemed only fitting that such a monster could only be portrayed as a ruler of society's cream of the crop, skillfully maneuvering alliances and marriages as she sees fit. It may seem strange to situate any type of mythical creature with a religious position. However, many folklore and legends portray monsters, demons, and, e and angels as being unearthly creatures. As such, I found that the manticore from the mountains of India to be an interesting representation of a man of cloth. Manticore is translated to man-eater and is very often depicted as having a man's face, a lion's body, a spiked tail, and three rows of sharp teeth. The description reminded me of a minister, red-faced from preaching, hoping his sermon was sharp enough to reach his parishioners. Finally, the last character is a nursery maid painted as a tengu from Japanese folklore. Tingu are red-faced and often have elongated ears, nose, and eyes. While they can hold human form, their nose retains its long shadow even while disguised. The Tingu's eyes are so large as to keep an eye on human children. Many stormy stories claim that this is so that they can swoop down and eat the young ones before anyone can catch them. However, other stories suggest that they are not watching the children but the parents and how they treat their offspring. If a Tengu finds a child unwanted or mistreated, they will feed them raven meat until the little one grows wings and can fly away together with their new Tengu mother. Altogether, my goal was met. I painted a monster in a dress. Not just any dress, but one of historical nuance and future possibilities. New legends and myths ready to be written and read with a handful of unearthly creatures and a Victorian-influenced paradigm. <laughs>